All right, so let's talk about the quantitative reasoning section of the TSI. So on the first section of the TSI, that initial 20 questions that you get, there are six quantitative reasoning questions. If you pass in that first section, you don't have to see any more quantitative reasoning questions because you'll be done after those first 20 questions. If you don't pass in those first 20 questions, you'll get an tw additional 12 quantitative reasoning questions in the diagnostic section. So the quantitative reasoning section of the test covers primarily things related to number sense, solving proportions. It's also where you're most likely to see word problems show up. Things dealing with like percentages, money. Um, a lot of times these questions can almost be common sense. Sometimes though it's just basic number manipulation. So let's start with this second question here. It says the variables X and Y are directly proportional. I'm gonna go ahead and underline that word. If I was taking the TSI on a computer, I would probably write something down like proportional and make a note of that. And the thing to remember about the word proportional is a proportion is an equation saying that two fractions are equivalent or two fractions are equal. And anytime you're setting up a proportion, you're writing a fraction to compare do two different things. So in this case, if it says the variables X and Y are directly proportional, it means we have a fraction comparing X and Y. So the variables X and Y are directly proportional and y equals two when x is equal to three. So I'm gonna take those two things and I'm gonna put them into my proportion. I'm gonna put them into a fraction with x on top and y on the bottom. So y is equal to two, so that goes on the bottom of my fraction, when x is equal to three. So that's gonna go on the top of my fraction. What is the value of y? So equals, because remember a proportion is an equation saying two fractions are equal. And then we're looking for y, so that's on the bottom of the fraction. What is the value of y when x is equal to 9? So my x's go on the top of my fraction. And now I have an equation that I can solve. And anytime you're solving a proportion, an equation where you have those two fractions, to solve this you're going to cross multiply, or a lot of times people call this the butterfly method. So we have 3 times y, which is just 3y, equals 9 times 2, which is 18. And then to solve this, we divide both sides by 3, which gives us y equals 6. So that would be our answer to this question. So proportion questions show up on the quantitative reasoning section. They sometimes show up in the geometry section as well when you're doing conversions between units like inches to feet or centimeters to meters. It's still setting up a proportion. Um, sometimes instead of a proportion with x and y, you'll see a word problem talking about the number of boys in class compared to the number of girls in a class, or the amount of eggs in a recipe compared to the amount of flour in a recipe. Anytime you're comparing two things and setting up an equation with those, you're typically gonna be writing a proportion, and it's always the same setup. Figure out which two things are you comparing and set up your proportion, x over y, or eggs over flour, or feet over miles, and then just plug in your numbers in the right spot. Um, so that's one thing that'll show up on the quantitative reasoning section. Something else that tends to show up on the quantitative reasoning section is solving equations as long as the equations are linear. So no powers, no square roots, no fractions, just what I would consider a standard equation. So this one says, if 3t minus 7 equals 5t, then 6t equals blank. And we're asked to find what 6t is. Now on a lot of these types of questions, you can actually do them really quickly by plugging in answer choices. The issue here is we're not looking for just t, so we can't take our answers and plug them in for t. We're looking for 6t. So we're actually gonna have to solve this as a equation and not just by plugging in our answer. So I'm gonna take my original equation, 3t minus seven equals 5t. Now to solve an equation, we wanna get all of our variables on the same side. In this case, we have 3t on the left and 5t on the right. I'm gonna try and get all of my variables over to the right side so that I have all my t's over on the right and I can leave my negative seven where it is on the left side. So anytime you have things on opposite sides of an equation that you're trying to put together, if they're the opposite, you have to do the opposite operation. So to get my 3t over to the right side, I can't just do 3t plus 5t. 
Since they're on opposite sides, I have to do the opposite. So to get rid of 3t, that's positive, so I need to subtract 3t. If I do that on the left, I have to do that on the right. 3t minus 3t is 0, so that can go away. And I can drop down my negative 7, drop down the equals, and then on the right side, 5t minus 3t leaves us with 2t. And then to solve this the rest of the way, now that we have t by itself on one side, we can divide by 2. Negative 7 divided by 2, I'm going to leave that as negative 7 over 2. But you could also write that as a decimal, in which case that would be negative 3.5. Either way works. Okay, If you have a calculator, it might be easier to type that in and write it as a decimal. So this is the value of t, which you'll notice isn't an answer choice. Um, it's not even close to any of our answer choices. But we're not asked for the value of t. We're asked for the value of 6t, so 6 times t. So I'm going to take this, negative 7 over 2, and plug it in over here. So I have 6t, so 6 times negative 7 over 2. Anytime you plug something into an equation, it's good to put it in parentheses. So 6 times negative 7 over 2, if you multiply those two together, you end up with negative 21. So our answer here would be C. So that's solving a linear equation. That's something you may have to do if you can't just plug in the value that you're looking for. Um, and then one more that I want to look at is this one, number 6. So this one kind of blends the line between quantitative reasoning and algebraic reasoning. This is kind of a little bit of both. The reason I'm looking at it here in the quantitative reasoning section instead of the algebraic reasoning section is because we can solve this by plugging in answers rather than by doing any algebra. So it says which of the following equations has both 1 and negative 3 as solutions? Well, I've given a list of equations. I have solutions. If I want to know if it's a solution, I can plug it in and see if it works. And I'm going to do that for both of my answers, 1 and negative 3. So I'm just going to start with the first equation. So I have x squared, but instead of x, I'm going to plug in 1. So 1 squared minus 2x, so 2 times 1, minus 3. I want to know if that's equal to 0. Notice when I plugged in 1, I put it in parentheses. Anytime you plug in a number, put it in parentheses. Now if we simplify this, we're going to do PEMDAS, so parentheses first. My parentheses don't have anything that can be simplified, though. It's just a single number. So next I do exponents. So I have 1 to the power of 2, which means 1 times 1, which is 1. So 1 minus 2 times 1 minus 3, and we're checking to see if that makes this equation true, so equals 0. Okay, after exponents, I multiply or divide. So in this case, I have 2 times neg two time negative 2 times 1, sorry. Negative 2 times 1, which is just negative 2. Then I can drop down everything else. So drop down the 1, drop down the minus 3. I want to figure out if that's equal to 0. Last step in our order of operations would be to add and subtract. So I can combine everything together on the left side. So 1 minus 2 minus 3 would give us negative 4, which is definitely not equal to 0. So A cannot be the answer. I don't even have to try checking negative 3 because I already know it can't be the answer since 1 didn't work. So let's try the next option. x squared plus 2x minus 3 equals 0. So again, I'm going to plug in 1. So 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 3 equals 0. Start with my exponents. 1 squared is 1 plus 2 times 1 minus 3. Now do multiplying and dividing. So drop down the 2 because 2 times 1 is 2, and then drop everything else down. So 1 plus 2 minus 3, 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 minus 3 would be 0. So, that was supposed to be a check mark. So, positive 1 worked. But for this to be the answer, both answer choices have to work. So now I need to try plugging in negative 3 as well. So I'm going to do the same exact thing with that equation right there. So this time I'm going to do negative 3 squared plus 2 times negative 3 minus 3. And I want to see if that's equal to 0. The order here is the same. I'm going to start with my exponent. Negative 3 squared means negative 3 times negative 3. Remember, if you multiply two negatives together, you get a positive. 
So we end up with positive 9 right here. If you're using a calculator for this, this negative 3 needs to be in parentheses or else you have to write it as negative 3 times negative 3. If not, your calculator will do things out of order and it'll give you a negative. So just be really careful when you're dealing with negatives. So negative 3 squared is positive 9. And then I'm going to bring everything else down. Next, we can do our multiplication. 2 times negative 3 would be negative 6. So we get 9 minus 6 minus 3 equals 0. And then if we simplify this, 9 minus 6 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. So this one is also true. So that means B is our answer. So that's kind of a quantitative reasoning trick. It's also an algebraic reasoning trick. There's some overlap there where you can take answers and plug them in or take what they give you and plug it into the answers and see which one is true. So that's the quantitative reasoning section of the TSI.